here. Boy, we've got a lot of folks here this morning. Clearly, a New Year's resolution with some of y'all was, I'm going to make class at least once a year. Thank you <laughs> for doing it today. It just uh, is, is a blessing to me. And so I appreciate it. I'm really excited about teaching this new series, The Greatness of God, Examining God's CV. Now, if you don't know what a CV is, don't worry. I'm going to tell you what it is in a little bit. But I got to tell you how this class came to be. Because it's not the series that I had originally in my mind to start teaching January whatever today is. Sixth, thank you. In fact, I had something else that I was teaching. But here's what happened to me. If y'all are looking for a seat over there, don't leave. We've got some seats down here. We got seats all over the place. Just, and if nothing else, come up here and sit on the stage. We'll introduce you. We'll interview you. We'll have a good time. Um, we've got some seats down here. Uh, we've got seats everywhere. All right, so here is the background behind how this class came to be. One of the blessings and curses of my life, professionally, is that I travel a lot. It's a blessing because I enjoy traveling, and I like to be in different places, and, and I like to meet different people. It's a curse because I'm on the road a lot. I miss my family. Uh, I, I, I tried to not travel as much when the kids were home, but we've got an empty nest, and Becky can come with me some. So now I'm, I'm on the road more, perhaps, than ever before. And I've learned tricks over the years about how to travel, things that really help me. So uh, um, one of the, the keys to any kind of travel, if you're traveling very far, is how to handle time changes. So today I go from here to Philadelphia. Well, that's a one-hour time change. That's no big deal. Tomorrow I'm from Philadelphia to Dallas. That's a one-hour time change. No big deal, especially because my body clock's already on central time. But if you've got to go more than a couple of hours... It can change things, and it normally takes a few days to get adjusted. One of the problems that I have is I wind up having to go to England a good bit. And in early December of last year, so a month ago, I had to go over to England to take a deposition. And I was only going to be there basically for 48 hours. Now, I couldn't leave until Sunday night because I like to teach this class and be with my family on Sunday, which means I don't land until Monday uh, around noon or so. And you've got to figure out, which means I'm landing midnight our time, you've got to figure out how to trick your body so that you can operate on London time. And different people have different techniques. I've got one I swear by. I call this my time change trick. Now, the time change trick is this. Once you land, you live by that clock, period. No exceptions. You land and you go take a nap because it's midnight by your body clock, and you're going to want to sleep six to eight hours, and you have just chunked the whole trip. You got no shot. So when you land, I landed at noon, I pretend it's noon. This is the time change trick. You land and you stay awake until what time you'd be going to bed locally. So I landed at noon, even though it was midnight our time. I stayed awake until 10 o'clock at night. That means that I was staying awake as long as I possibly could so that I could go to sleep in London time and trick my body into thinking it was living in London when in fact it's only four in the afternoon in Houston. Now your body doesn't like to be tricked. So you've got to really trick it. Because my body's thinking, okay, I didn't really sleep last night, but it's only four in the afternoon. Why am I going to sleep? I guess I'm tired, but four in the afternoon? So you just got to persuade your body that it's 10 p.m., 
which it is in London, and you go to sleep. Now, there's a flaw in my trick. The flaw is this. You cannot, cannot, cannot wake up until the proper time to wake up in London. Because if you wake up after two or three hours, your body thinks it just took a power nap and you can't go back to sleep. Your body thinks, hey, I went to sleep at four in the afternoon because I was wiped out, but I took a two or three hour nap. Now I'm feeling pretty good. I'm ready to go till midnight. And it totally, totally ruins what you're trying to do. I mean, it's, you're shot, okay? So, I'm feeling pretty good. I made it to 10 without taking a nap. I've gone to sleep. But then, I had a problem. I had made a mistake. I didn't turn off my phone. So, I've done everything right. And my phone starts ringing at one in the morning, London time. Now you think, what Nimrod is calling at one in the morning? <laughs> well, it's a Nimrod who lives in Houston, where it's not one in the morning, it's still 5 p.m. That's a legit time to call somebody. I look at caller ID to see who the Nimrod is. I realize it's not my wife, it's not my children, it's not my mom, it's not my sisters. I don't have to answer it. I think it was my brother-in-law. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Randy, Kevin, I would have answered for y'all. Um, I'm thinking, I don't have to answer this, this isn't an emergency. So I put the phone down, but there's a major problem. My body thinks I just took a power nap and it's 5 p.m. and it no more wants to go to sleep than the man in the moon. But if I get up at 1 a.m. in London time, I'm going to be stinking the rest of the day and I've got to take this incredibly important deposition. My mind has to be working. So fortunately, I have tricks for going to sleep when you can't go to sleep. This is a whole nother level of tricks that the brain can play on the body. See, these are the kinds of freebies you get when you come to this class. You think you came to study the Bible, and we will. But you're getting all sorts of extras, all right? So, how do you go to sleep when you can't go to sleep? You turn out the lights. You have the temperature right in the room. You're not with your snoring wife. Not that I have one. She has a snoring husband. Um, you're, you're there. And in your brain, or in my brain, this is what I do. Remember, I'm a Bible nerd. I start saying the Lord's Prayer. I just pray the Lord's Prayer. And I try to pray it in the expanded version. So I'll say the phrase and I'll think about it. And I'll pray through the phrase. I figure this is getting everybody on my side. God knows I need sleep, so he's going to help me go to sleep. My body knows I need to go to sleep, so it's calmly, deliberatively thinking about God. What safer place could I be to go to sleep? Even Satan wants me to go to sleep at this point because he doesn't like me praying to God. So I've got everybody on the same side. I'm thinking this is golden, right? So, and being a Bible nerd, of course, I say the Lord's Prayer in Greek. So I'm praying the Lord's Prayer in Greek in my hotel bed at 1 a.m. in London, England, trying to go to sleep. Whoops, come on, there we go. Trying to go to sleep. Now, you know the Lord's Prayer, at least in English. The Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Or in Greek, it's Hagia Theto to Onomasu. Hagia Theto, got to get these synced up, to Onomasu. Hallowed be your name. Now, y'all need to look at this Greek for a minute, so we're going to throw it over here and expand it a little bit. Hagia Theto. Hagia Theto. Y'all need to say that. Hagia Theto. Y'all are great. And then you can say it's Greek to me. <laughs> Hagias theto, to, say to, onama, onama, su, su. Now, if you actually speak Greek, you might be saying, that's not the way you pronounce it. The, you've done the O as a long O in to, it should be ta. Well, not in Lubbock, <laughs> which is where I learned my Greek. So if you don't like the way I pronounce my Greek, move to Lubbock and learn how to talk right. <laughs> I think it might help you if we put up the English under this so that you've got it. Hagias theto, hallowed be, is the way we typically translate it. To means the but we don't translate that. It just disappears. Hallowed be to the name onoma su, yours, of you. Hallowed be the name of you. Hallowed be name yours. And that's what it is. Now, I'm praying this in Greek and I'm trying to deconstruct it because I'm doing the long version so I go to sleep. Otherwise, you'll make it through the whole prayer. You won't have gone to sleep. You'll be saying, well, Lanier, that trick didn't work. Okay, you got to like deconstruct it. So I'm praying. And Carol, are you looking for a seat? Yeah, there's one. Just uh, there, We've got one down here. Y'all love on Carol. She's looking for a seat. Um, so I'm praying this. And, and in the process, I'm breaking it down. So let's break it down together. The word hagias theto comes from a Greek root that, ah, my remote is just finicky today. Comes from a Greek root. So let's get rid of the, 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 the things that tell us how the verb is operating. Hagias is our word that we're going to look at here. Hagias means holy, hallowed. Set apart, honored, praised, exalted. There's a semantic, a wide semantic range of meaning that's ascribed to this word because it, it's kind of like getting the blue ribbon. There's not anybody else like you. You are removed. You are, you are unlike the others. The others are ordinary. They are profane compared to you, which are holy, hallowed, great, superlative, the best, numero uno. The, the, the top of the heap. That's, that's the idea that's wrapped up in this. You got it? All right, so that's the hallowed. Hallowed be the name. Now this word name in the Greek, onoma. Onoma, if you're pronouncing it like a Lubbockite. Onoma, if you're not. Onoma. Onoma means name. Means is a bad word to use when you're translating languages because one word doesn't really mean another one. It's, it's got a wide range of meaning. But included within onoma is our idea of name. But a name is a label. Typically for us, it's the label which we call someone. My name is William Mark Lanier. I go by Mark. My dad's name was William Howard Lanier. My dad went by William or Bill, and my parents didn't want there to be confusion, so I go by my middle name. But I kept my father's first name. That was the reasoning. 
So all my life, all I've ever been called is Mark, except for my fourth grade teacher at Volmer Elementary in Rochester, New York. Her name was Miss Offensend. Yes, it was an offensive name. <laughs> Miss Offensend, who was probably 55, 60 at the time, so figure she's about 120 now. <laughs> Miss Offensend, so Miss Offensend, if you're watching, wait, if you're watching this, <laughs> I love you. Um, Miss Offensend proclaimed to me, she called roll on the first day, and she called me out as William Lanier. And I said, well, I go by Mark. And she said, well, Mark is not your first name. And I said, I go by my middle name, Mark. And she said, well, not in my class. Your name is William. And if your parents had wanted you to go by Mark, they should have named you Mark. <laughs> so she was going to be insistent on calling me William. And about six weeks into school, there would be a uh, parent-teacher conference to make sure that everything was going smoothly. And Catherine and I were the school-age people. Holly was like some little whiny baby at the time. So Catherine and I, she like one or two or something, you know. So Catherine and I are really on pins and needles because we want to make sure when the teacher comes home that, that mom and dad, I mean, when their parents come home, mom and dad were happy with the parent-teacher conference. Mom and dad come home. Mom's laughing when I said to her, how did it go? And I don't know if that's good or bad. And she basically tells me in kind and gentle terms, well, your teacher hates your guts. She thinks you're terrible. She thinks you're offensive. She thinks that you disregard her and you um, uh, 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 are uh, disrespectful. And I said, Mom, I promise I'm not those things. Mom said, I know you're not. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, the teacher says that Almost every time she calls on you, you won't give her the time of day. <laughs> you won't answer her. You ignore her. And I said, boy, that's just not like Mark. Every other class he's had, he's gotten in trouble for talking too much. It started young. And, and she said, tell me more about this. And the teacher said, well, for example, just today. I said to him, William. What is the answer to this problem? Mom said, William? She said, well, yes, I call your son William. That's what you named him. Well, no, he goes by Mark. Not in my class. <laughs> if you want him to go by Mark, you should have made that his first name. I just got mom on my side, by the way, when she said that. And uh, mom said, uh, well, did it ever occur to you that when you're calling out William, he doesn't realize you're talking to him. And that's why he doesn't answer. And that's true. I mean, she'd say, William, what's the answer to this? Well, I'm not going to speak out. I'm Mark. But William, I know, is an idiot because he doesn't answer anything. <laughs> and I know the answer. So mom told Miss Offenson, if she didn't call me Mark, it would stunt my growth and my mom would take it to the principal. And Miss um, Offenson <laughs> still hated my guts. <laughs> but she called me Mark. That was remarkable. And, um, and class went on. Our name is a label. And so when we read that in the Bible, we tend to just think of a label. And when we do, we cut Scripture and ourselves way short. Because Onoma is translated name, but it means so much more. The best Scripture I know for illustrating this is Psalm 9, verse 10. Here's what it says. Psalm 9, 10 says, those 
who know your name put their trust in you. Now in Hebrew, the name of God, yod Hey vav Hey. We typically would say Yahweh in evangelical circles of today. Probably not the way it was pronounced then. The King James Bible translated it as Jehovah. Most of our English Bibles today translate it as Lord, but with all capital letters. Just the O-R-D is in a smaller font. That's the name that God told Moses was his. Now the psalm writer does not mean those who know that God's name is Yahweh will put their trust in him. I've talked to a lot of people who write on the name of God. I'll bet Lawson can list them as well. Who don't even believe he exists, much less put their trust in him. Or at least are pretty doubtful he exists. Just knowing what name he gave Moses is not going to make you put your trust in him. It's not. Name doesn't mean simply the, the label. The personal scription that goes to someone. By the way, in Hebrew, we've got some good Hebrew readers in here today. So I've put it up here for you. In Hebrew, uh, Semecha is at the end. That is, Semecha is, is your name. It's Shem is the Hebrew word for name. It's interesting also, the Yiv Techu is, is an in the imperative form. Look at, look at it in Greek because the Jews did us a favor a couple hundred years before Jesus and translated this into Greek. In fact, Paul quotes the Greek New Testament more than he does the Hebrew. James, the book of James, written by the brother of Jesus, quotes the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, which tells you that James, and, and you read James in Greek, and it reads pretty good Greek. James, the brother of Jesus, was really good with Greek. Jesus was too. It was the language of commerce especially up in Galilee. So, elpisatosan is, is from the, the, the root elpis means to hope. And here it is in an imperative form. Imperative. Those will hope upon you. Epise, upon you. Those will. It's imperative. It will happen. It is certain. It is a certainty that you will hope in God, upon God, epise, Hoi gnoskontes is uh, uh, the participle for gnosko is, is no, right, no, okay. Those that are knowing, to onomasu. Does to onomasu ring a bell? Same three words in the Lord's Prayer. To onomasu, except instead of knowing, it is hallowed be. But that is the name of you. Your name. Hallowed be your name. So this is what the psalmist is saying. He's saying something more than those who know what your name is will put their trust in you. He's saying those who know your character. That's what onama means. It's your character. We still use the word name like that a little bit. A good name is to be desired more than great gold. That doesn't mean, you know, a name that's easy to spell. It means your character. It means your reputation. It's who you are. It's what you've done. That's wrapped up in that word Shem. That's wrapped up in the Greek onoma. That's the name of God. That's, it, look, it, if, if your character and your reputation did not match your name, they'd change your name. I mean, Jacob, Yaakov means a, a, a grasper, 
A supplanter becomes a colloquial, idiomatic idea of someone who's a trickster. And he was until God changed him. And he wrestles with God at the Jabbok River, which is a stream. And God changes his name and says, you've been called the trickster, but now you've wrestled with God. Now your name is different. You're not the trickster anymore. Now you are Israel. And your name fit who you were. I mean, women a lot of times in childbirth would name their kids. God smiled upon me. And this is like kid number 11. And then it's, why does God hate me? <laughs> that was the kid's name. I think in our modern parlance, the name is better understood as your CV, your curriculum vitae. Do you know what a CV is? How many of you, oh, oh, this is such a geek question. It's not fair to even ask it. How many of you took Latin? Oh, wow, that's pretty cool. This is Latin curriculum. Whoops, I left out the U. Curriculum vitae. Or if we were pronouncing it in Latin, it'd be vitae, because their V's were W's. But that's basically your professional life. That's the story around your life. That's your, the, the story of your life. Those things that surround your life. It's kind of like what we think of as a resume. And most curriculum vitae will start out and they'll have professional information. But they'll have personal information as well. Usually that's even before the professional. They'll have your education. They'll have your publications. They'll have presentations you've made. They'll have sometimes references, honors and awards you've received. Those are up there above. I left that out, but those are frequently on there. You've got all of this stuff. That's your CV. That's who you are. So I'm thinking about this in London. And I'm thinking this is who God is. This is his CV. This is what he's done. And I'm thinking it on the day, well actually I guess it's in the middle of the night, but before I'd gone to bed, I had been reading the New York Times, okay? This is the New York Times, let's get this up. And the New York Times had had a big headline story. I pulled it off the internet so you could see it too. Thomas Altizer, 91, proponent of God is dead theology dies. Young people. There used to be something called magazines. <laughs> One of them was called Time. And it was a big deal. To get on the cover of Time magazine was a big deal. It was a weekly news magazine. We used to get the news every week. And it was fresh because it was just five, six days old. <laughs> and so... The New York Times was pointing out Thomas Altizer because in the 60s, his theology made the cover of Time magazine when Time magazine proclaimed, Is God Dead? Altizer had been a theology professor at Emory University, I believe. Is that a yes? Okay, good. Glad I got that right. Um, he... Um, He's writing this theology in the 60s that says there can't be a God because look at all of the garbage that's been going on. And if you think about it, in the mid-60s, they're still unpacking World War II. World War II ends in 1945, 20 years earlier. Now, I was alive in 1965, but for me, World War II was always really ancient. Or as my wife would say, ancient, because she doesn't think there's a K in that word. Ancient, A-N-K, 
I-N-E-C-T, ancient. Really ancient. But it wasn't in the 60s. You think back, those of you who are my age, think back 20 years ago was 2000. That wasn't that long ago. They were still unpacking this. And so they're figuring out all of these atrocities of what really went on, not just in the concentration camps, but what Lenin and Stalin had done, what Mao Zedong had done. They're figuring out all of these atrocities, what had happened in Cambodia and what had happened in Indonesia and Africa. And, and, and the 20th century was wrecked with evil and hideous wickedness that, that really hurt and persecuted and prosecuted and killed people. And Thomas Altizer says, if there's a God who's got any ability at all to stop this, then he's dead because this could never have happened under a good God's watch. Well, that's a legitimate point. He's wrong. But he raises a really good question that is worthy of inspection. Now, I want to set aside for a moment all of this and tell you that, that I love teaching this class. I took a degree in Hebrew and Greek so I could teach the Word of God. I've tried to keep them up and, and learn and grow in those languages so that I could teach the Word of God. I love to write about God. I love to pray to God. I love to worship God. I'm, 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 the center of my being is as a Christian. But I happen to make a living doing something else. None of this is what I do for a living. I make a living in courtrooms as a lawyer. One of the things that I do in courtrooms is I examine witnesses. Those that are on my side and those that are on the side of the bad guys. <laughs> By definition, that's whichever side's not mine. That's what I do. And every expert witness that takes the stand, by and large, has to produce their CV. They've got to produce their curriculum vitae. And I scour those. For 35 years, I've read those in great detail. If it's my witness, I read them because I want the jury to know the good things my witness has done. The next case I've got coming up for trial that we're about to start in Dallas, one of my witnesses is Dr. Bernard Morey. Now, a lot of CVs are one and two pages. Dr. Bernard Morey, I'm putting him on the stand. He's an orthopedic surgeon. He's like up there. His CV is like, I don't know, 228 pages or something. Okay, this is the guy who did, when, when President George Bush could pick anyone to do his hip replacement, this is the doctor he picked. Barbara Bush, Dr. Morey. Billy Graham, Dr. Morey. You baseball fan? If you are, Tommy Johns, the pitcher, who was a good pitcher, but he was going to not ever be able to play again because of his elbow. No surgeon could fix that elbow. Dr. Morey, they call the surgery, he invented the Tommy John surgery. Dr. Morey worked and put himself through medical school as a rocket scientist at NASA who wrote the protocols for Apollo 13 to come back after the big problems. I mean, this guy's published like nobody's business. His CV is incredible. I read it with great detail because I want that jury to know how studly my expert is. <laughs> but I not only read them for a direct examination, I read them for cross-examination. And I've learned some people lie on their CV. I've caught them 
making up articles that were published. That we did that this summer at the tout trial in St. Louis. I had an expert on the stand with articles. They were never published. They're on their CV. I wrote this article and published it. No, you didn't. We looked it up. It doesn't exist. Or we found people who put the same article two or three times in their CV to make it look like they've written a lot more than they have. It's kind of like, well, you just said that on page four. <laughs> you know, you can't, did you write it twice? You know, I mean, it's the same thing. Don't act like you've done. And people make stuff up. So I read these with a fine tooth comb because I use them as, as I mean, it's part of my bread and butter. So now let's merge this together. I'm lying in bed in London, England, trying to go back to sleep, saying the Lord's Prayer in Greek, fleshing out, Hagias Theto to Onomasu, hallowed be the name that's yours. And as I'm fleshing it out, how can I declare that God's name would be Hagias, that it would be declared holy, that it would be declared great? How can I talk about the greatness of God, His name, His CV? And I'm thinking, you know, His CV's got some good things. But if we've got a thorough CV of God, there are some things on there that make people like Thomas Altizer say He doesn't exist. <laughs> and that's when it struck me. I want to examine God's CV with y'all. For my next series. So, yeah, you clap now. <laughs> it was a horrible event because instead of going to sleep, now the wheels are whirring. <laughs> including me thinking, there's a really good chance I'm going to drop off any minute now because one of the rules of this is you got to keep your eyes closed while you're praying, laying there. I'm thinking, I could drop off. And I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll totally forget about this as a series. Thinking, well, if I get up and start writing this stuff down, I'll never go back to sleep. So I went to where the crime first occurred. <laughs> and I, like, because I refused to even open my eyes. And I grab it, I pull it over, and I go, Hey, Siri, remind me to write about the greatness of God examining his CV. Okay, I added write about the greatness of God examining his CV to your reminders. And I went to sleep. And I got the reminder the next day. And I started writing. And I've written the CV of God. Now, as a practical matter, I couldn't fit everything in there because he's been responsible for all of history, everything that happened before history and everything that's coming forward. I didn't have that much ink. I didn't have that much paper. I didn't have that much computer space. I didn't have that much mental capacity and I wouldn't even be able to do anything else for the rest of my life and I still wouldn't touch a hangnail. So I just picked out some of my favorite highlights to put onto his CV. Now I'm doing these as, as written lessons. So if you want to get an emailed copy of this, which would include God's CV that I've written out, make sure you're on the mailing list. You alert Brent, you alert Janet Seifert. Janet, where are you? Raise your hand, stand up so they can see you. Janet's learning to play tennis. Y'all need to appreciate that with her. <laughs> Um, you tell anyone in leadership and they'll figure out how to make sure you get copies of these written lessons. But uh, I just decided I was going to write God's CV. Now that's kind of daunting and I did it with fear and trepidation and a great deal of unworthiness because I'm not, you know, I'm not claiming to capture God on a sheet of paper and let's be real clear about that. He's far beyond my ability to even begin to do that. But this is what I would expect him to have on his CV if he were giving it out. And I was responsible for writing it. He might write it totally differently. I don't know the mind of God. So his CV, 
Well, personal. What are his traits? He's all loving. He's holy. He's true. He's the truth. He's moral and righteous. And I keep those as separate terms because they have a different meaning biblically. God is moral, but they're tied. And he is righteous. That whole DK set of righteous words in the Greek. He's omnipotent. Omnipotent. In Latin, omni means all. Potent means strong, power, potent. God is all powerful. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. Omni means all. Scient means like science we get from it. It's knowing. God is all knowing. He's omniscient is the way we pronounce it. And wise. Related words, but different words. God is social. Greg, stay. Greg, right back there. Emailed me, uh, got a draft of this, said, you really need to add that. Because I didn't have it in the resume. So, yeah, you're right, I got to add that. Thank you, Greg. He's social. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image. God is three in one. He's perfectly social within himself. He's communicative. Jesus is God, yet Jesus prays to God the Father. Communicative, communicative, and social. What else do we know about him personally? One God in three persons. What? Trinity? Triune? Often called Father, Son, Holy Spirit? What? That's on the CV. We need to study it. We need to understand these things. As we understand these things fully, we are hallowing the name of God, who he is, his CV, his character, his reputation. We are showing his greatness, his holiness, his far exceptional everything over that which is profane and mundane, which is everything else. His address He's outside the material universe. The fancy theological word for that is transcendent. God's outside of everything that's ever been made. He existed totally independent and still does of this universe and all that is in it. And yet, at the same time, he is present within the universe everywhere. He is omnipresent. The theological term for that is imminent. Speak of the imminence of God. Progeny. Children. Well, he's got one unique son, but not a son that came into being that didn't used to exist. The one unique son has always existed. And then he's got, to me, countless, not to him, adopted children who call him Abba Father. We make up the family of God. I don't have time today, so maybe it's next week, but the curriculum vitae has got his professional section. He's the creator. Not just creator of heaven and earth, creating a new heart in me. Psalm 51. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. But God's not only creator professionally. There we go. He's also destroyer. Whether it's destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, destroy the world in a flood, 
destroy the land of Egypt, killing all of its firstborn, destroy the village of Ai, destroy the inhabitants of Canaan, destroy liars and bloodthirsty people, destroy the wicked. I mean, you can go down through the list. It's all there. He's a destroyer. He's not just a destroyer. I'll go past that. He's a provider. He's not only a provider. We don't have time. He's a lawgiver. He's not only a lawgiver. He is a teacher who calls you by your name, Miss Offenson, <laughs> where you'll answer. He is a teacher. He not only is a teacher, he's a judge. He's not just a judge. He is a counselor. He's not just a counselor. He is a friend. And so we've got passages that explain all of this in his CV. As we go into the details of him as friend, as redeemer. He's been recognized from the beginning as a redeemer who redeems his people from current circumstances, but he redeems them eternally. He formed us as a redeemer. And then we're going to look at his references. Jesus, the apostles, Paul, martyred saints, us, the Holy Spirit. I don't know if we're going to do it by looking just through the CV or the table of contents, but I want to talk about who he is and what he's got to do with us. Why has he done some horrible things in allowing evil? Truth and consequences, not the town in New Mexico. Promises kept, the courtroom drama, the promises still open, witnesses and references. Those are the matters that I want to try to cover as we work through this series. But here are your lessons to go because we're out of time today. First of all, God is great. The psalmist is right. If you're not trusting in God, you just don't understand how great he is. Because when you know how great he is, you will put your trust in him. You flat will. So if you see yourself needing more trust in God, this is the series for you. Because you cannot walk away from understanding his greatness without putting your trust in him. So let's embrace the challenge and let's live the result and let it change who we are. Can I bless you in the name of Jesus before we go? Father, thank you so much for the chance to be alive this year. Right now in this time and place, Father, the time that you've just given us, we thank you for it. It is my earnest prayer that by your Holy Spirit, you will teach us, remind us, grow us into understanding more fully who you are. Your greatness, Father, that shakes us to our core, that brings us to our knees in humble adoration, filled with awe and fear and respect and admiration as we seek to, to not only understand you, but to walk in humility with you. growing before you and letting you transform our lives. We thank you for your promises to do that in Jesus. Amen.